Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. In the headlines this week, the biggest snake species to ever live has been named, the oldest bread ever has been found, there's been an unlikely discovery of a hominid mandible in the floor of someone's renovated house, and much more. Starting off the news this week, it's fantastic news from our interstellar legend Voyager 1, which became the first human-made object ever to reach interstellar space, that is the space between stars, in 2012. Voyager 2 joined it later in an event that we were able to report on in 7 Days of Science in 2018. Unfortunately for Voyager 1, NASA found that they had stopped receiving both scientific data it was collecting and engineering data about the status of the craft in November last year. There was still some sort of response as we knew that Voyager 1 was receiving commands and seemingly operating as normal, but these crucial parts of data were missing. The team isolated the fault to a chip on one of the probe's onboard computers, which is responsible for storing some of the memory of the flight data subsystem, which holds the data NASA weren't receiving before it is sent in a usable format to Earth. The team came up with the ingenious solution of moving the corrupted code to another part of the flight data subsystem, having to split the code in order to make it fit. This is of course a tricky endeavour, as the code needs to be split in a way that makes it usable as it's packaged and sent to Earth. After sending their solution to Voyager 1, there then came the excruciating 45-hour wait to hear back. The Trailblazer spacecraft is over 15 million miles away, and so signals to and from Earth take quite a while to reach their target. Fantastically, the team have heard back from Voyager 1 and now have access to its engineering data, allowing it to update us on its general health and status as it moves ever further from our sun. Some fantastic news from one of humanity's most exciting exploits. Let's hope they can get that science data back to us soon as well. In other news, archaeologists in Turkey have found what they say to be the oldest bread ever discovered. It was found in the ancient settlement of Chattel Hurjuk, which was discovered in 1960 and has since yielded some fascinating insights into early human settlements. The town was likely first founded about 9,500 years ago and stopped seeing use about 8,000 years ago. The archaeologists working at the site at the moment found a number of exciting items around an oven in a town building, different crop remains as well as a spongy material that, upon further analysis, was determined to be fermented bread. What raises even further questions about this is that the spongy bread was uncooked, and what causes this foodstuff to be left in an abandoned town for 8,500 years has yet to be determined. This is not the first discovery of ancient bread, and there has been much evidence of the ancient Egyptians baking sourdough bread, but this particular loaf is much older. While the archaeologists who made this discovery have said that it's the oldest bread in the world, there was a discovery of some flatbread made in 2018 that is just under 16,500 years old, significantly predating both this uncooked loaf and agriculture itself. Nevertheless, it is a fascinating find and this ancient town continues to provide us with more incredible crumbs of information about humanity's past. I see what you did there, Doug. Very nice. Moving away from our own past and back up to space, a paper published in the journal Nature Astronomy has hailed Venus as an anchor point for us to use as an understanding for planetary habitability. In the grand scheme of things, there is actually a rather large amount that we don't know about planetary habitability, as what makes Earth habitable isn't quite as simple as its position inside what's known as the habitability zone in our solar system, that is, the optimal distance from the sun to be habitable for life. There is an enormous amount going on underneath the surface, and in indeed with the Earth's core itself, that influences the habitability of our planet. And exactly how this all works isn't always entirely clear. Venus is a remarkably similar planet to Earth. It sits at a similar distance from our star and is a very similar mass. And yet, Venus has a particularly uninhabitable surface. The atmospheric heat and pressure would kill us almost instantly. The researchers say that by studying Venus and comparing its atmospheric composition, astronomical behaviours, and internal geology to that of Earth's, we can work out just why these two planets are so different, despite their similarities. The thick atmosphere makes it very difficult to study Venus's surface, and so we know almost nothing about its core. It has been thought that the core is of relatively small size, as Venus doesn't have a detectable magnetic field at all, which is another potentially surprising difference to our own planet. The authors of the study say that recent studies that attempt to analyse the makeup and habitability of Venus only further emphasise the work that should be done, and we should hopefully have a lot more data to work on with the upcoming NASA and ESA's missions to one of our closest neighbours. 
Next, a very small update on the orca calf that is trapped on a lagoon on the west coast of Vancouver Island. At the time of writing, there is no further news about Brave Little Hunter, but our thoughts are still with her and the people trying to rescue her. Hopefully, we will have some positive news to report next week. In the environmental news this week, a report released by the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority has revealed that Australia's Great Barrier Reef is currently experiencing its worst mass bleaching event on record. And according to scientists at the US National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the world is currently experiencing a global coral bleaching event, which is the fourth global event on record and the second in the last 10 years. Coral is made up of tiny animals which have symbiotic algae living inside them, called zooxanthellae. If coral becomes stressed, often due to high oceanic temperatures, it expels the algae. These algae provide the colour seen in corals and also carry out photosynthesis, providing the coral with vital energy. Scientists have been monitoring the event using satellite images of the bleaching, and since early 2023, mass bleaching of coral reefs has been confirmed throughout the tropics, Australia's Great Barrier Reef, large areas of the South Pacific and parts of the Indian Ocean Basin. Corals can recover from bleaching events, but the occurrence of bleaching has increased, now taking place on the Great Barrier Reef every other year for the past six years, which means that there's just not enough time for these organisms to recover. Based on aerial surveys of the reef, the report finds that around three quarters of the whole Great Barrier Reef shows signs of bleaching and almost 40% of the reef is displaying high or extreme bleaching. Marine biologists are understandably incredibly concerned, stating that they've never seen this level of heat stress across all regions of the barrier reef before. Record-breaking high sea surface temperatures in 2023 have driven coral bleaching events worldwide, and coral reefs are now fundamentally changing composition as the faster recovering coral species become more abundant. However, these fast-growing species are also some of the most at risk of bleaching, meaning the reef as a whole becomes less able to cope with the next bleaching event. The incredible diversity of the coral species on the reef does provide hope that this habitat will adapt to the changing conditions and higher sea surface temperatures. However, they won't be the same reefs they once were, undoubtedly affecting the oceanic food web at large. This summer, the reef has also experienced two cyclones which damaged and killed coral reefs, and the southern section of the park has also experienced an outbreak of the native crown of thorn starfish. A reef that is not experiencing heat stress can be resilient to these additional impacts, but given the accumulated effect of all of these issues, the long-term survival of some parts of the reef are in jeopardy. As a consequence, in July, the World Heritage Committee is due to decide if the Great Barrier Reef should be placed on a list of sites in danger. First up in the paleontology news this week, there's been a very exciting fossil discovery in India as a new species of giant prehistoric snake has been found, which may have been the biggest snake to ever live. It's been named Vasuki Indicus, which the paper explains comes from the Hindu mythical serpent Vasuki, who is worn around the neck of Lord Shiva, plus Indicus to honour India. Vasuki is known from a partial vertebral column comprising 27 individual bones, and they are described as being exceptionally large and massive. Vasuki lived around 47 million years ago during the Eocene Epoch, and is a kind of snake belonging to the extinct Madsoid lineage, which lived from around 100 million years ago to very recently, and are mostly known from southern continents, although they did live in Europe during the Cretaceous period too. The size estimates for Vasuki put this animal at between 11 to 15 meters in length, or about 36 to 49 feet, which is rather incredible considering that the biggest green anacondas today reach about 6.3 meters long, or about 21 feet. This also potentially makes it even longer than the well-known Titanoboa from South America, which has been estimated at around 13 to 14 meters long, about 43 to 46 feet. The dimensions of the vertebrae from Vasuki are slightly smaller than the vertebrae of Titanoboa, but using predictive equations to estimate the total length of the snake resulted in these larger values. Although the paleontologists themselves say that these estimates should be treated with caution since the exact evolutionary relationships of the Matsoid snakes are still uncertain, and therefore estimating their size based on data from modern snakes may be problematic. Nevertheless, Vasuki was undoubtedly a huge animal and likely lived in swampy habitats, moving slowly through the undergrowth and using ambush hunting techniques to capture prey, which it would then kill through constriction, similar to modern anacondas and large pythons. An absolutely incredible fossil discovery. It's been a fantastic week for giant prehistoric animals as we've also had the publication of a paper naming a new species of ichthyosaur, 
which is in the running for the title of the biggest animal to have ever lived. I won't go into too much detail about this animal here as I'm preparing a whole video about this enormous marine reptile, so for more details be sure to look out for that. Ichthyosaurs are well known for being quite dolphin-like, although there are a lineage of reptiles that lived alongside the dinosaurs. The new species has been named Ichthyotitan sevenensis, meaning giant fish lizard of the seven and it's based on a very large bone from the back of the lower jaw that was discovered in Somerset in the UK. Another very large jaw bone from this ichthyosaur had previously been found nearby a few years earlier, and together these two bones now form the basis of this species. Ichthyotitan was most likely a kind of ichthyosaur called a Shastasaurid, a group that had some other giant members which lived during the Triassic period. And comparing the lower jaw bones known for Ichthyotitan with the same bones in the more complete Shastasaurid specimens, the researchers have found that this new species may have reached lengths of around 26 meters or 85 feet. Fragments of even larger ichthyosaurs found nearby also hint at the potential for individuals reaching over 33 meters in length or 108 feet, meaning that these ichthyosaurs were not only probably the largest marine reptiles we know of, but were potentially the biggest animals to ever live, growing even bigger than blue whales. Again, I'll be making a much more detailed video about Ichthyotitan <laughs> and discussing all the length estimates, so I hope you'll look forward to it. Also in the Paleo News this week, a new species of Jurassic fish has been named from southern Germany. This new species has been called Toarchocephalus morlock, with the species name referring to the morlocks of H.G. Wells' The Time Machine, as the paleontologists noticed an uncanny similarity between these creatures and the fish, which both have large eyes, blunt faces, and pointed teeth a perfect descriptive name for the animal. The fossil remains of Tawakocephalus are very interesting for the way they've been preserved, as both specimens of the new species show signs of having been preyed upon. One of these specimens is a complete skull with no trace of the body skeleton, and most of the bones in the skull are perfectly articulated. This might therefore be an instance of the fish having been decapitated when a predator attacked it, consuming the body and leaving behind the head of this poor fish, which then sank to the sea floor and became rapidly buried. The other specimen is another mostly articulated skull with a few pieces from the body, which shows evidence of having been regurgitated by a predator. So it's essentially a piece of fossilized vomit. It seems that after the remains of the fish were ejected from the predator, they were held together by a mucus-like adhesive, explaining why the jumbled up bones are still associated, and then it again sank down and became buried. So a fascinating new Jurassic fish species and some incredible instances of prehistoric behavior preserved in the fossil record. And finally for the recent news, there's been quite an unusual story developing over the last couple of weeks, as a Reddit user on the fossil subreddit posted an image of a travertine floor in the parents' recently renovated house, which shows something rather incredible. A cross section through a hominin jaw. Travertine is a kind of limestone that forms near natural mineral springs, in particular hot springs as calcium carbonate precipitates around them to form deposits. The interesting looking internal textures of this rock therefore makes it a popular one for walls or floorings. The Reddit user who posted their discovery is actually a dentist and immediately recognized the cross section through the mandible as looking very human-like. And since their original post, they've also found a few more pieces of bone in tiles nearby. The travertine apparently came from Turkey, and the user has been contacted by several researchers who want to study the specimen, so hopefully they will be able to learn a lot more about the hominin that this mandible is from. It's a very exciting story, and if you happen to have any travertine in your house, then be sure to check it for any fossils of your own. Well, that's it for the news this week. I really hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science, and we'll see you next time.